Welcome, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. I am Loretta Yarlow, the director of the University Museum of Contemporary Art, the UMCA, and thrilled that you are all here for the celebration of Ronnie Horn's exhibition opening and to attend the panel discussion. So, full disclosure, I've been waiting 15 years for this opportunity for this pleasure, for this honor to work with Ronnie Horn and to have this exhibition here at the university, to have it here in Amherst, the hometown of Emily Dickinson, who Ronnie has worked, who has thought about so deeply over the years, influential to her projects and her art. Equally influential to her projects and art is Iceland, a country that she's traveled to um, since the mid 70s. Um, has had great rapport with the people, the landscape, the geology. It's evident in a lot of her work. Um, uh, sculpture, bookworks, um, installations, drawings, and photography. And so what we have on view of Pi is um, clearly connected to her interest in Iceland. Uh, so we will look forward to seeing you uh, often to that exhibition. So given the fact that uh, the focus of the exhibition is Iceland. We brought together uh, wonderful colleagues from UMass to um, for this conversation with Ronnie. So we have two uh, geoscientists from the geoscience department, honored to have Dr. Julie Brigham Gretti and Dr. William Daniels, um, who have made their life's work, their focus, their research is on the Arctic Circle, um, of course, all of that uh, land masses of interest in, in Iceland being on the on that circle. Um, and delighted to have Shauna McDonald, an artist, chair of the department, uh, art department, and um, hailing from the far north as well, northern Scotland, and um, making her life's project research of the idea of north. Um, so uh, I won't take a lot of time. We have one hour because we have the wonderful theater department. I want to acknowledge that they have given us this theater for our talk. They have to be back on stage for their uh, work in progress, and we have to be downstairs for our opening at 6 o'clock. Um, so thanking the theater department, thanking our UMass, UMCA staff, I mean really. Um, heartfelt thanks, all behind the scenes work, Amanda Herman, Betsy Wolfson, Jenny Lind, Maestro Lyle Dennett, um, installation manager who worked very closely with uh, us and Ronnie and her, her, um, her uh, advice from the uh, gallery to produce an exhibition space that's conducive to a uh, immersive circular uh, experience. So thank you Lyle for all your work and everything else. Um, so we will, um, Turn this over, uh, and there's an order in which we will invite everyone to speak. Julie will present her research in paleo environments and climate evolution in Iceland. Will focuses his talk on climate ecology and anthropological changes in Iceland from where Julie leaves off to the present. Ronnie, well, we'll see what your thoughts are. We're, uh, we are, whatever you want, you get. <laughs> Thank you so much for impromptu ideas as to how you will uh, focus your talk. Shona will make closing remarks to reframe and bridge the, the presentations with her shared interests in geographical location, in time, weather, light, land, and water. Hope we'll have 15 minutes for Q&A. If not, then please downstairs continue your conversations with our, uh, the artist and our panelists. So thank you so much. On to Julie. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to correct Loretta a little bit. This is not exactly going to be about my research, but I want you to, I'm going to set the framework just by saying, I, Iceland hasn't always been there. It's kind of a new, it's a new subcontinent for us, and I want to talk about uh, evidence for that, just to lay a landscape on what we then, at the end, here, our human landscape laid on that natural landscape. 
So, of course, we look at the world like this, and here you see in brown is the bottom of the ocean, and you see a lot of texture there. And if we look very carefully at that texture, we can see that, in fact, the Earth is made of a series of tectonic plates. And we know that they're moving around even today. Um, sometimes at the rate that your fingernails grow is kind of what geologists like to tell people. And I want you to particularly notice that Iceland is right here on a plate boundary between North American plate and the Eurasia plate. And they've been getting farther and farther apart basically splitting Iceland in half, and Iceland is growing to benefit from that. So let's take a look at, look at that. So here's a little animation that shows you, particularly starting, focus here on Greenland, what's happening with Greenland as it moves here. That was 200 million years ago, now we're up to 100 million years ago, 90 million, 80 million, 70, 60, let's count down, 50, uh, <laughs> 30, 20, 10, and up to today. So you can see this amazing opening of the North Atlantic started around 60 million years ago. Tremendous volcanism happening on both Greenland and also the Atlantic margin as we spread these continents apart. And of course, Iceland is sitting right along this uh, area right here on the spreading ridge. But Iceland is also important because it's also a hot spot, okay? It sits on a place where there's plumes of mantle material coming up from the core mantle boundary, uh, you know, uh, way deep in the earth, and that material's coming uh, to the surface. And what's interesting about these hot spots, Hawaii is another one, Yellowstone National Park is another hot spot. The magma plume doesn't move, but the continents move over the top of this plume. So the plume stays in one place, and the continents move over it. And just to show you what has happened to this plume, over time is this next uh, animation here from NASA showing you how, here's Greenland and Iceland today, and this is the hot truck spot, or the hot spot track over time. So now we're gonna go into the past, 100 million years ago, and here you can see Greenland migrating across that hot spot to where we are today with the hot spot sitting right here with the spreading ridges running up and down uh, through this part of the continent. So Iceland is really dynamic for lots of reasons. Um, and here's what, Iceland, or here's what Iceland looked like three million years ago, and I bet you can't even find it. There's not much to Iceland. Iceland was just coming on the scene. This is what North America looked like. There wasn't much of a Greenland ice sheet back then. And we know from looking at uh, we go, I got it there. Whoops. Too hard. Okay, we know from looking at organisms that live along the, or the, the Arctic coast there uh, what, the, what the climate was like. It was a lot warmer than it is today. We had um, trees and forests right up to the Arctic Ocean, and we have organisms like this, in, you know, even woolly camels all the way back up in Ellesmere Island, so it's kind of interesting to think about what was happening on this remote area of Iceland that was just emerging from the sea, what was evolving there. So here's kind of a cross-section of Iceland, a little uh, introductory cartoon with the uh, mantle plume coming up. This is a spreading ridge with the hot spot on it. So not only is magma coming up, generating new earth crust, but we have a hot spot on top uh, sitting uh, more or less here where where Iceland is growing. And you can see the spreading of the landscape uh, even today. Um, here you can see the ridges here in South Iceland. You see the ridges. Here is the Eurasian plate, and here is the North American plate spreading apart. And if we look at there, if we look at this oblique, um, this is in Google Earth, so you can go home and do this, look at Iceland and look at it on the, an oblique view, you can, you can pick out the ridges and see how it's spreading uh, on either side of these. And there's two different spreading ridges here uh, that you can see. And of course, here, this is the first parliament of Iceland from the year 930, was established here right in the rift zone. Um, they celebrated, I guess in 1930, they celebrated a 1,000 
uh, anniversary of the Parliament here, located here in the in the uh, in the rift zone, and you can go there today and walk around and <coughs> walk down the rift zone between the plates. And of course, to up, uh, whoops. <laughs> All right. So of course, it's still active today. Um, this and other eruptions that happen up through the ice sheets, we can see uh, volcanic plumes that are so bad they shut down European airfare or air flights for weeks on end. And oh, I'm sorry. Oh, it is a little funky, this thing. Well, OK, so I'll just go on. So the, the other thing I wanted to mention is, the last picture was just showing you the, the island of Surtsees, which is off the south coast of Iceland. Surtsees uh, is another place along the rift zone, just offshore of the southern coast, that erupted through sea level, came up above sea level, and, and was uh, volcanically active starting in about 1963. Now, I was in third grade then, and I remember hearing about this. It was kind of exciting, and you saw the pictures on the black and white TVs back then. And of course, it continued to erupt until through 1967 and so on. And we've even had some geologists here in our, depart our geology department go out to Surtsees and take cores from there. But it's not, um, it's not over. So I just came through Iceland yesterday. I was in northern Norway yesterday morning. I came through Iceland, and of course, people are worried. There is a mountain called Mount Thorn, uh, Thornbjorn, or, right? Anyway, it's a small area near the Reykjavik Airport and the Blue Lagoon, if you've been there, and it's rising. So there is a swelling caused by the increase of a magma chamber down in the crust, and it's um, rising at three to four millimeters a day. So they're monitoring it. The local geologists say, don't worry, we're, you know, it could just subside. So anyway, if you're going through Reykjavik Airport, airport I suggest you find out what's going on with that swelling uh, and, the, and any uh, ongoing volcanism that may be happening near the airport. And the other thing that I just want to mention at my last slide here is that um, both the volcanic um, uh, aspects of, the, of Iceland and also the geologic or the um, ice, uh, glacial activity on the island continue to shape the island every day. And uh, particularly when these volcanic eruptions occur up through the ice sheets, the small ice caps on Iceland, they cause tremendous flooding called yaukalyps. Yaukalyps, there's lots of fun gen um, pronouncing that word. And these are great <laughs> massive floods which can tear out the local road system, the circular road systems around there. So they have to constantly be rebuilt. So this landscape is dynamic. And um, our activities on this landscape are also important. And this is where Will is going to pick up from me to talk about the evolution of Iceland. Thanks, Julie. Uh, hi, it's a real pleasure to be part of this uh, exhibit opening tonight. Uh, I love all things Arctic, and I spent a lot of time in Alaska and Greenland and just a little bit of time in Iceland. But I think no matter where you go in the Arctic, it evokes some, some emotions of, of, you just feel like you're in a primeval place um, when you see the sun doing circles in the sky above you without ever rising or setting or a herd of a thousand caribou walking by you, you just sense that there's this cyclicity in, in nature and this constant, constancy that I think are captured in some of Ronnie's work here. Um, so what I'd like to do tonight today is just talk about um, the environmental history and cultural history of Iceland. And what I want you to take away is uh, some of the same environmental factors that shaped early Icelandic culture or society are the same ones at play today. Um, and in this way, in this cultural narrative, we also see cyclicity and constancy expressed. Uh, so to start, I'm just gonna talk about when Iceland 
was settled and by who. Uh, this is a map of Europe and the North Atlantic region. And in the ninth century, the Norse culture was expanding um, both eastward into Europe and west across the North Atlantic region. They settled islands such as the Orkneys, the Shetlands, the Faroes. And I think on a transit from Norway to the Faroes, someone got lost and ended up discovering Iceland. Um, so in 874 AD, Ingolfar Arneson settled the first uh, permanent settlement of Iceland, uh, making Iceland, uh, it's been inhabited for about 1,146 years now. That seems like a long time in some ways, but it's also relatively short, especially on the time scale that Julie just talked about, where Iceland is three million years old. Uh, so who were these people? They were the Norse, um, the Vikings, basically. And they were probably fleeing violence um, or looking for new farmland. And when they arrived in Iceland, they were farmers. Uh, they, they brought livestock with them that they grazed on the landscape. And within about 50 years, the entirety of Iceland, all the arable land was claimed. So it's a very rapid colonization of the island. And that brings us to the first environmental uh, human interaction which is that the grazing of their livestock severely impacted the land. So these pie graphs um, are, sh are showing the relative distribution of different types of bones in archaeological middens. These are basically garbage piles. And in the ninth century, right after settlement, the, the people were heavily reliant on domesticated animals. And of those, there was a good mixture of cattle, sheep, pigs, um, and goats. But within a few centuries, by the 13th century, um, the grazing and the deforestation together uh, basically completely altered the landscape. Um, the loss of forests meant that grazing goats and pigs was difficult, and so they, bas uh, they were basically only farming sheep by this point. And the land had degraded so much that the domesticated animals only made up about a quarter of the bones here. And uh, subsistence fishing became much more important. And that's a direct result of their changes in the landscape. The problem of erosion is still strong in Iceland. This is showing a kind of a pedestal of residual so original soils. And this is how much erosion has happened. They estimate about 65% of Iceland's soil has uh, disappeared through erosion. Um, since human habitation. If that happened in the Pioneer Valley, that would be a major blow to the farming community here. Um, but in the 18th, 19th, 20th centuries, deforestation picked back up. Um, and today, the people of Iceland are really trying to stop the erosion. They're planting grass and hay and trees and doing anything that they can to, to keep their soils. To really drive this uh, point home, this is a pie chart showing the distribution of land cover during settlement. You can see it's about 45% grassland, 20% forest, and about a quarter was barren ground, whereas today it's over 60% barren ground. Um, so this is a real problem. Uh, it's likely that the Vikings knew what they were doing to the land, and they just didn't know how to stop it. Their, their farming practices worked fine in Scandinavia, in their homeland, but the volcanic soils of Iceland were more fragile, and they weren't prepared for that. Some people, some scientists have speculated that the change in land cover was not a result of farming, but instead was driven by climate. So I want to shift gears here a little bit and talk about the climate history of Iceland. On the left here is a map of the North Atlantic um, showing that the Gulf Stream and the North Atlantic Current bring relatively warm air to Iceland, keeping the temperatures relatively mild, kind of like Boston. But Iceland sits right at this border between the Arctic and the temperate latitudes, meaning that it's very sensitive to temperature changes. Um, the temperature changes are amplified there relative to other places. On the right is a graph showing the last 2,000 years of temperature for the Northern Hemisphere uh, from 0 AD to 2000 AD. And this is in terms of an anom anomaly. And these, the black line here is from thermometers. 
All the other colored lines are from geological reconstructions. Um, and the blue one here is the curve developed by UMass's Ray Bradley that he had to defend in Congress. Um, but the, the big point here is that during this era of Norse settlement in Iceland, the biggest feature is this climate deterioration from the medieval warm period around 1200 AD to the Little Ice Age around, uh, starting around the 14th century. And during this time, it became even harder for the Norse inhabitants to farm. They couldn't grow their uh, barley or their livestock feed, and they became even more reliant on the fishery. During that same period of climate deterioration, uh, there was an increased uh, role of foreign countries. Uh, basically, they were under foreign rule for about 500 years. Uh, the problem today is the opposite. We're warming up instead of cooling. In Iceland, the way this is expressed most visibly is through the retreat of glaciers. So we're just going to look at the Solheim Yoko Glacier real quick, and then I'll wrap up. Um, this is a tongue of the biggest ice sheet on Iceland. And I'll show you a series of pictures from the last 25 years or so that show the retreat of this glacier. So here's 1997, 2000, 2003, 2005, 2007, and 2010. It's retreating at about 100 meters per year. So this is a very visible effect of climate change. There are other effects on the fisheries and the boat transports and whatnot that I won't go into. But just to summarize, um, the history of Iceland, uh, you see these interactions between human effects on the land, the effect of climate change on humans and on the land, and then how those environmental changes feed back and affect, uh, affect the people. And the same themes that were coming up a thousand years ago are still coming up today, just being expressed in different ways. That's all, thank you. Um, I'm not a geologist or a anthropologist, but uh, I have been uh, going to Iceland since 1975, so I picked up a few things about the culture, particularly about the geology, because my original uh, thought about going to Iceland, and interestingly enough, I, I think what Julie was saying about Surtsey, people always ask me why I go to Iceland, I have no idea. But I started to think about where the hell I even found out that Iceland existed. And I think it was certain because it occurred in 1963, and it occurred two weeks before JFK was assassinated. And both of those events were documented on TV. So my instinct is that, that there was a point where, and, and I, I remember Cersei being a something that really quite interested me at the time as much as, as the assassination. Uh, you know, in their own way, equally violent acts with very different results. Um, what I'm gonna do is, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a funny time for me because I've been spending the last uh, year or so writing uh, just because that's what I feel like doing. And uh, in the fall, I'll be publishing a book, which is a collection of writings uh, uh, that are not about Iceland, but they're inspired by Iceland and my experiences there, um, which have been deeply influential on everything uh, I do. Uh, so let me read to you, the book is called Island Zombie, and not to be confused with Zombie Island. <clears throat> so, uh, this is actually the introduction, and depending on how much time we have, I'll, I'll, I'll perhaps read a, a couple of other short pieces. My first venture abroad was Iceland. It was 1975 and I was 19. My memory of the trip is dominated by weather. The sky, the wind, and the light all made a strong impression. Weather simply hadn't occurred to me before then. 
1978, I received a grant from graduate school. I used it to return to Iceland the following year. For six months, I roamed the island. With a dirt bike modified for long distance travel, I was portable. I lived in a tent furnished with candles, sleeping bag, and cook stove, pitching camp wherever I tired. It was a solitary journey. The roads were unpaved. The bike was well suited. With no limits on access, I went everywhere. The distinction between public and private hardly existed then, and never restricted direction. Anywhere was possible. Except for short interludes, I was outside 24-7. Exposed to inclement weather, the riotous force of the wind, and the loud whining of the two-stroke engine, the roads not fit for distance made travel demanding and slow. That spring and summer, the seasons of my journey, were claimed as the coldest and wettest in the island's recorded meteorological history. With no grading, the dirt roads hugged the natural contour of the landscape. The local ups and downs greatly slowed horizontal progress. Would travel attenuated in this manner, arrival lingered endlessly off in the distance. I returned to Iceland with migratory insistence and regularity. The necessity of it was part of me. Iceland was the only place I went without cause just to be there. Early on, I imagined compiling an inventory of rocks and geologic debris. Each rock was that compelling. Travel was crowded with attention-grabbing views and weird organic formations. To date, there's no inventory, but I remember the rocks. In 1982, the National Chief of Lighthouse Keepers gave me permission to stay in a lighthouse off the coast of Iceland. For six weeks, I lived up on the bluff at Tirhole. The building from the early part of the 20th century included living quarters. But when the light was automated, the lighthouse went uninhabited for decades. I arrived in early May, and since I wasn't going anywhere, it soon began to feel like an act of submergence, going deep but not going far. Staying put among local change was travel. The bluff was action-packed. It was a matter of attention between the water and the light, the bird song and the wind, the rocks and the weather between the sand and the seals and the eider and the puff, and I was busy. From then on, it was clear to me, Iceland had become my muse, compelling and necessary. From the mid-1980s, I began work on Two Place, a series of books, an encyclopedia of sorts, based in my lifelong relationship to the island. The first volume, Bluff Life, was published in 1990. Currently, it is 10 volumes deep. I'm not anticipating an end to it, since I've discovered paradoxically that Two Place becomes less complete with each new volume. By the early 1990s, Iceland had become quarry and source. At times, travel seemed closer to hunting or mining. Extraction, I thought, was the basic act. The drawing, sculpture, and photographic work I was producing at the time integrated the presence of the island and the experience it offered. But as I view the dynamic now, the reality was quite different. Iceland was a force, one that had taken possession of me. I recall the first image I associated with Iceland from childhood. It was that of a horizonless ocean at the center of the earth. I knew it was Iceland, because Jules Verne had decided, discovered, or determined that the entrance to the center of the earth was located there. With all the years and all my travels, the truth of this insight has only deepened. I'm often asked, but have no idea why I chose Iceland, why I first started going, why I still go. I believe Iceland chose me. The island, the ocean surround, the going north, the light, the emptiness, the full-up vacancy, the wholeness, the absence of parts, the wholeness of something entire, the completeness of something whole, the frequency of white, the whiteness of white, the open space, 
the nothing of open space, the accumulation of nothing, the nothing plus nothing that is still nothing, the nothing pl plus nothing that is still transparent, the horizon, the horizon that always exaggerates the proximity of the horizon, the possibility of infinity, the visibility of infinity, the visibility of the weather, the visibility of other worlds, the sense of seeing beyond sight, the plain circumstance, the now, the perpetual now, the unsuspendable now, the no other than now, the treelessness, the treelessness that provokes no desire for trees, the views, the views in the scale of the planet, the openness, the continuity, the fool me endlessness, the being far away, the feeling of being surrounded by far away, the sense of place, the with my eyes closed sense of place, the possibility of being present, the sense of being present, the being present, the unsolicited awareness, the ineluctable awareness, the sheer awareness, the solitude, the solitude of distance, the solitude of only, the solitude of no way back, the cool air, the cold air, the nothing but air, air, the spirit, the air that is more spirit than thing, the wild, wild air, the largeness of the moon, the closeness of celestial bodies, the light from non-terrestrial sources, the shadows, the darkness of shade, the darkness of light withdrawn, the black earth, the black sand, and the black ash, and the black rocks, the pink pumice, the unnatural looking natural red earth, the rocks, the rocks shaped to platonic stardom, the rocks in their organic ambiguity, the basalt everywhere, the basalt with its liquid past, the basalt cool and cracked and whole even when in pieces, the erratics, the always solitary erratics, the desert, the unbroken emptiness of the desert, the not nothing of the desert, the absence of threat, the absence of threat, the mystery, the mystery that chaperones me, the mystery that accompanies the light, dark and bright, the mystery held in plain sight, the wind, the many, many forces of the wind, the indifference of the wind, the stillness when it is still, the silence when it is still, the weather, the unpredictable weather, the danger, the simplicity, the clarity, the youth, the chance, the opportunity, the desire, the absence of the hidden, the absence of secrets, the feeling of the absence of secrets, the unused, the unoccupied, the uninhabited, the absence of hierarchy, the transparency of time and space, the transparency of place, the crazy infant geology, the unworn and the broken and the always complete geology, the self-evident geology, the water, the water, the water. Question, what is a soul possessed by isolated and sentient forces? Answer, an island zombie. <clears throat> Since 
as um, Loretta pointed out, my connection to um, Emily Dickinson, um, I, I'd like to read one short text called uh, When Dickinson Shut Her Eyes, which is, which is a reference to her writings where she speaks about to shut my eyes is travel. When Dickinson shut her eyes, I go to Iceland. Recently, I was rereading the letters of Emily Dickinson. I began wondering about travel in Iceland, too, wondering about the insistence of my returns here, about their necessity and the migratory regularity of them. I began to wonder about travel altogether, about the how and the what of it. Travel isn't so simple as a car or a train or as nameable as a place. I thought about Emily Dickinson's travels. From the first letter she wrote, she told her correspondents she didn't go out, she didn't want to go out, and that she would not come to visit them. Dickinson stayed home insistently. Walking herself into her upstairs room, she invented another form of travel and went places. Dickinson's invention was multiplication, herself an empirical reach. Everything that could be felt, heard, seen, or smelt, everything perceptible, everything discernible from 280 Main Street, Amherst, Massachusetts. Perceptible includes the library. Somehow Dickinson used the library as an empirical source. Somehow she learned to consume its contents sensorially. Her library was not a source of acquired knowledge, not a tool of the intellect. Her library was simply another perceptible thing becoming another entrance, confirmation of all she sensed in the world. Even her poems about God and death are eyewitness. Sequestered from the world, knowing that going out into it hampered her ability to invent it, Dickinson stayed home except for two summer trips to Cambridge as a child and one to Washington later in life. Dickinson stayed home <clears throat> when Ralph Waldo Emerson visited her brother next door. Her business, she said, was circumference. In her verse, Dickinson spoke of Vesuvius at home. In her letter, she said she traveled when she closed her eyes and that she went to sleep as though it were a country. In her room alone, she said, was freedom. Here she wrote 1,775 poems Dickinson shut her eyes and went places this world never was. For the time being, Dickinson is here with me in Iceland. For someone who stayed home, she fits naturally into this distant and necessary place. Her writing is an equivalent of this unique island. Dickinson invented a syntax out of herself, and Iceland did too. Volcanoes do. Dickinson stayed home to get at the world, but home is an island like this one, and I come to this island to get at the very center of the world. Read, read another text. Uh, it's called Monroe, Iceland. <clears throat> I thought I'd take a picture. It was a sublime but common scene. The sun was setting, the waters of the ocean inlet were quiet, almost still. The, the light reflected in them illuminated the perfect symmetry, the perfect asymmetry of an undisturbed world. I looked at the camera to frame the shot, but the instant I found the image, the view disappeared. In its place, a mouth filled the viewfinder. A woman's mouth, voluptuous and moist. Her lips parted slightly as they crowded out the scene. Instantly, the view telescoped. Uncanny and disparate things settled into profound intimacy. The landscape became sensuous white flesh and provocative moist lips. A few wispy blonde hairs here and there waited to be brushed aside. It was a headshot, a portrait of Monroe the one taken in 1962 by Bert Stern, the one that appeared on the cover of Marilyn, Norman Mailer's biography. It was this image that kept coming to me, coming to me like the scene of a crime or an accident. 
After many years of travel, familiarity with the island has diminished the, sen the sensational element. The powerful stuff, the poetic and majestic stuff, was still there. But camouflage now among the mundane and the ordinary. What could I do? Take the picture that would only be the most sens sensational thing, isolated and fixed? Even though extraordinary things can't really be separated from the experience they offer, I could take the picture because the extraordinary and the ordinary are much closer than you'd think. I could take it because the sublime and the criminal are too. But the view remained crowded, now filled with the inimitable symmetries and aberrations of an undisturbed and disturbing world. Thank you. daunting to try to tie all this up, um, so I'm not really going to try to do that. I'm going to make some observations um, and kind of put this out there uh, to any of the panelists or in the audience, uh, you know, make, make some comments. Or um, The first thing I wanted to say was um, growing up in northeast Scotland, uh, I, I always, was always aware of um, what I've come to call the sediment of time. I never thought about it that way when I was a child, but um, in thinking about it now, um, and I guess this could be parsed out as the way history is, is baked into the land. Um, and I was just wondering um, if you know, Ronnie or I, any of the panelists could, could uh, comment upon that. I find it very interesting your presentation, Julie, where you um, you actually told us that Iceland is new because you don't necessarily think about it that way. Scotland, of course, is an ancient country, but um, I just wonder about that phrase, sediment of time, and that's something that you could anyone could pick up. Yeah, I think um, one of the gifts that we as geologists have is we. We see the um, we see the planet, you know, across a, a time spectrum that most normal people don't see. Mm -hmm. And for example, the valley here used to be filled with a giant proglacial lake. So when I drive to Stop and Shop or Big Y, I'm underneath the I'm on the bottom of the lake. Most people don't think like that, but I think you know. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I think it it's a perspective of your landscape. I mean, you see it, uh, we all see it through different lenses. And I think that what you're speaking to is that, that lens of time and accumulation, whether it's human history or whether it's the earth history, um, it provides that richness to our perspectives. You know, in terms of the sediment of time, I'd like to just refer to my own biography. Because, for example, this photograph was taken in 1975. I was 19, and that lava field came into existence in 1783. So, we're all young there. And you have 70s hair. Definitely. And what's interesting about this photograph is the resemblance. I don't know whether you noticed that between Iceland and myself. <laughs> But speaking of, of change, uh, of the layering of time, I, I think <clears throat> when I look back over the, the time I spent in Iceland, I've watched the landscape physically change uh, from, from, time, from year to year. And one of the most notable was uh, going there in 1975. I was up in the north right along this tectonic plate that Julia was talking about. There's a, an area where it's quite visible. You can't mistake it. It's definitely a tectonic plate. Um, and you climb down into it, and there is this incredible, uh, what they call a hot pot, you know, where you can just sit in the hot water, and it's uh, not quite a cave, because the daylight gets in there, and it's quite exquisite. So that was 1975. In 1980, around there, it was 82 or something, there was a, an eruption, Krapla erupted in the north, and that water, when I went back to it, 
was boiling. So uh, I'm, I'm going to talk about uh, surface and landscape. Um, and this, I think, uh, brings up both Ronnie's work and Julie and Will's work. Um, so through the, the cropping that, that you use in your work, the landscape images imply infinite space. The space expands both horizontally and vertically, just like the images of strata and layering in, in your presentations, Julie and Will. Uh, so in essence, this attention to surface connects your, your work, all three of your work. The surface is the first thing you see, the, the surface is the first thing you encounter in Ronnie's work, or the first thing we see, and the first thing we encounter in the landscape. But it conceals this vastness of space, time, and history. Um, and I'm, I'm just wondering if that's something that anyone would like to take up. Um, yeah, I, I think one of the most impressive things in the Arctic is this feeling of space that you get. And I think the poem that you read, the first one, really painted a picture for me of just the vastness and, and the treelessness. Um, so you just enter this landscape that's really otherworldly. Uh, and, and that's, I think, based on what the surface of the land looks like. So that's a really stark impression you get. Makes me wonder if, if you're born in New England, where there's, you're surrounded by forests, you respond the same way as someone who maybe grows up in southern Arizona, where that openness is there, but different. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's open, but it's, it's not like a brown desert. It's green in many places. It's green, but it's treeless. So here, when we go for a walk in the woods, we walk on the trails. But as your poem captured, when you walk in the Arctic, you, you can just go any direction you want and you don't have to be confined to trails. It's a really magical thing. Well, you can do that, or um, uh, now that there are so many of us, you can't do that anymore. <laughs> Not at all. Um, but if, if you get a really good snow, heavy snow, and it's nice and cold, the Icelanders have definitely, they've invented these tires you know, so you have five pounds of pressure, and these tires just like balloons that you're driving on. And as long as you have your global, global satellite positioning, which is so precise now, you can just kind of head out blindfolded. Uh, you know, obviously the cliffs are the only issue, but uh, <laughs> most of the rivers are frozen, and, and you don't damage anything. Yeah. Um, and Julie, in your last slide, the, the caption reads, read, nature and man continue to tolerate each other. And this question of a blurring between natural and cultural is, in a sense, whimsically engaged in pie with the inclusion of the sitcom images in, the, in your installation, Ronnie. The larger question is, can one retreat into nature in, in a place like Iceland? Can we, can we still do that, or is this somewhat of an illusion? Oh, I think you can definitely escape into nature. There's so much of it that's vast, and you get the feeling you're the first person to walk there, which is probably not true, but you, you still have that, that feeling of wilderness and openness is, can, is still achievable. But it's certainly uh, a challenge as we look at Iceland trying to maintain its economy and their increase in tourism and uh, and so they're, they in themselves are in conflict with how they balance those two. Uh, many of you might not know that Iceland is one of the largest producers or smelters of, of aluminum. It's so cheap, the energy is so cheap there with the geothermal that all the company, co companies around the world bring their ore to Iceland to use the cheap geothermal energy to produce aluminum. Um, but I think if anyone was going to do it in a sustainable way, it's probably the Icelanders. Um, well, go ahead. You know, that's, it's, this is an interesting subject because I've not been going to Iceland much because I can't get lost anymore. And part of that is obviously pathological, psychological. 
but a lot of it's technological. Um, there is, it's not so much about Iceland getting overbuilt or anything like that. There are definitely areas where the infrastructure is still quite minimal and you don't get a lot of tourists, but you really can't get lost anymore because you're on the map. And that alone creates a very different relationship to the landscape and the possibility of being in wilderness. Because <clears throat> from my perspective, and I'm not, I, I'm not an experienced explorer, but just from a psychological point of view, I don't really see how you could be in that wilderness where with the danger and the mystery and the I don't know where I'm going, it doesn't exist anymore. So I have a very, uh, my relationship with Iceland's curtailed somewhat in, in the light of this, this reality, which isn't to say that, that there aren't incredibly beautiful things there. Um, I don't encourage anybody to go there. <laughs> but there are incredibly beautiful things. I actually wanted to ask you question about the installation. Um, well, uh, for, there's, there's two questions. First of all, I was wondering about the, the tight cropping of the photos and the frames, and your intention with that. I'm not aware of tight cropping. You've got views of the, Atlanta, the Arctic Circle that are wide angle. I meant, I meant literally. The, the, the photos are really tight in the frames, literally. I, that's just a stylistic decision. There's not really much more to it. Okay. Yeah. Um, so obviously they're installed uh, higher up than we're, we're normally used to. And when I was down there, my head was craning up to see into the photos. So I found they were becoming less less illusory and more object-like, um, uh, but at the same time unobtainable because I could only see so much. And I wonder if this odd physicality is a, is a reference to the landscape of Iceland or some any of your feelings about it or why you could talk a little bit more about the, the height of the install. Yeah, it's very simple. Uh, you put it up high and you have to back off to the middle of the room so you can see it. So it functions like a horizon. Mm -hmm. It doesn't function like a picture of a Arctic fox and you want to see all the details and stuff. I'm not really in, interested in describing something with photography. So this is a way of getting you more into an experiential realm. Mm -hmm. uh, well, uh, so we turn it over to the audience. We have about 10 minutes left. Um, uh, and I just want to mention, I, I didn't do full bio introductions because on your programs, I mean, all the achievements of our panelists are extraordinary. It would have taken a full hour for me to say, who they are, so please refer to your, your programs that give full, full information about everyone that we're honored to have here. All right. Well, I have to ask this because it was really interesting walking into the installation just now um, to experience images that were so high up, and I was a bit ticked off by that at first, and I thought, why, 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 why do you, do you do that? They're so beautiful, I want to look up closer, I want to see the textures and the colors, and who are these people, and I can't see them properly, and then I realized something really lovely that you had provided for us, which was if you do stand in the middle of the exhibit area, um, you start to look at the people who are looking at your work, and I just loved that. I loved that there were so many students here tonight working and drawing and interacting with the exhibit. And I loved that you gave us that opportunity very viscerally to, to look at your images in relation to the people who were looking at your images and those shapes and those textures and um, the surfaces <laughs> that you were talking about. That was so beautifully created for me. I was, just want to say that. I'm glad I ticked you off. That's always a good start. <laughs> I'll hand this to you. Can I reach? 
I find it um, interesting and somewhat paradoxical that all of you speak of the vastness of the landscape in this what is really a tiny country relative to the rest of the world. And do you have any thoughts about how that vastness gets created in that smaller space? Well, because of the, I mean, you can only see so far on the horizon because we live on a globe. So, I mean, somewhere out there on that horizon is the edge of what you can see. And I think that always is framing our perspective of what is vastness. Uh, and Ronnie talked about the fact that you can look out on the ocean, sometimes you get this mirage that makes things look so much bigger than it should be. Um, but I, so I think that, you know, your, your feeling of vastness comes from the fact that you, you, ha you also have to know you have a limited horizon uh, sometimes. And, um, but there's an, a vastness in Iceland also that, that comes from the fact that above you are these large plateaus and uh, various um, cliffs and so on that actually help uh, contribute to the, the sense of isolation and vastness. The thoughts on vastness, first of all, my idea of vastness is much more psychological because Iceland is like what the size of Tennessee or something, it's quite small. But you can stand in the middle of Iceland and see at least three of the four directions, the shoreline. So think about that. So I think that vastness is, that you experience in Iceland is a lot a condition of the weather. So you don't have trees, right? So you have, well, you do now, unfortunately, but you didn't. When I was there for decades, there were no trees, literally. You could just see everything on a clear day. You know, there was just no nothing obscuring um, anything. So you're going right out until the globe took it away from you, literally. You know, so it's it is a tiny country. Uh, try crossing the desert in a sandstorm; it gets vast really quick. So there, you know, the other idea of vastness is about uh, really this incredibly unpredictable, violent weather that um, really prevents easy passage. So you get into an experience of time and place that's quite, quite endless and uh, not not really reflective of the scale. Yeah. Yeah, I, I would agree with that. I um, I think that the vastness is is also vertical. It's not, it's not just this way, it's this way and, and down. So I think it's a, a term that's actually quite appropriate. We have time for maybe one more question. Thank you. Hi, this is a question for Ronnie. Um, my class is working, looking at your work this morning and they were all coming up with a series of questions. And, and there are two that seem pertinent. Um, they were wondering really about the extended photo series that you did in Iceland. What the editing process was like, and at what point did the sequences start to emerge as? You're talking about the one that's uh, upstairs, Pi, or, because there, there are there a few. several, yeah. The one that, so we looked at the images of uh, the woman. You are the weather. Okay, well, so that one, <clears throat> that started with this idea uh, that maybe you could get at, you know, in a way, a portrait of a place through a single face. So that was kind of the seed. So, and the rest of it was really just having a good time because we traveled all over Iceland uh, and hit all the hot spots, which are just hot pots. They're not, not nightclubs or anything. So. <laughs> and, uh, <clears throat> so that the sequences are from different locations. Um, I don't think I had the title. I got the title from looking at the photographs, and when I saw that she was, in effect, a multitude in one person, uh, there were so many personas coming out just as a, a result of 
uh, her relationship to the light and the rain and, the, and whatever was going on outside, you know. Um, so the editing on that became uh, clarifying those personas that that uh, I I saw in in the experience, and I tried to, as I do with all of my photographic work, the descriptive for me is the least interesting part. So I try to push the viewer back from that kind of knowing into more psychological um, um, spaces. You know, so you don't get, you know, you don't get her smiling, she's never crying, you know, nothing, nothing extreme in her expression. You've kind of pulled it into the middle and you're going really from persona to persona and from weather condition to weather condition. That seems to be enough to get, you know, a really kind of intricate measure of her humanity and the sense of place. I think we should all head to the exhibition. Um, thank you. Keep your programs for information not only about our speakers, but uh, there are some listings of events that we'll have at the museum that connect to exhibition, film screening, tours, poetry readings. Thank you so much, truly. Really.